이란이란 나라가 존재하는 오직 한 가지 이유는 지구상에서 이스라엘을 없애버리는 것이다. 이슬람은 평화의 종교가 아닙니다. 이슬람은 거짓이고 학살의 영입니다. 이래도 이스라엘이 아직도 전쟁 범죄 국가입니까? 이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이란은이
an organization that was leading terror attacks, that was part of the massacre of October 7, will have zero legitimacy for the state of Israel and there will be zero collaboration and recognition for UNRWA. Ayatollah Ali Khamenei made the decision to go prepare for the attack after reviewing the damage from last week's attack by Israel, according to the New York Times. Iran's top general says the Islamic regime will hit Israelis with what he called an unimaginable response. You can't live in a sea of fire. You are small. You don't even have somewhere to escape. For all of Iran's bluster, Saudi Arabia's foreign minister thinks the Iranians realize how vulnerable they are and fear a full-on fight with the IDF. My sense is that, it, at least uh, on their side, that they realize the risks of escalation and would prefer uh, to avoid it. Axios reports Israeli intelligence suggests the attack could be launched by pro-Iran militias in Iraq and not from Iran itself possibly to avoid another Israeli strike on Iran. The reports follow Israel's second attack on Iran last week. At the time, Israel destroyed much of Iran's ballistic missile production and its air defense systems. One U.S. official said the damage to Iran's air defense system is so extensive it left Iran basically blind. Israel did not hit either Iran's oil facilities or its nuclear facilities in that attack. However, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced at an IDF officer's graduation ceremony that the nuclear sites are Israel's chief concern. The supreme objective that I have set for the IDF and the security services is to prevent Iran from attaining nuclear weapons. Halting the nuclear program has been and remains our chief concern. I have not taken, we have not taken, and we will not take our eyes off this objective. Obviously, I cannot detail our plans to achieve the supreme goal. And while tensions with Iran escalate, Israel is hitting Hezbollah targets throughout Lebanon, while IDF troops are advancing in the southern part of the country. The military campaign is taking place amid talks of a ceasefire deal and questions if a ceasefire could hold. Netanyahu says these talks miss Israel's top concern. The main point is our ability and determination to enforce security, thwart attacks against us, and act against the arming of our enemies, as necessary and despite any pressure and constraints. This is the main point. Thursday was one of the deadliest for Israel, where seven were killed in Hezbollah attacks. The IDF also released this interview, where a United Nations Relief and Works Agency employee described how Hamas commandeered UNRWA vehicles as a form of defense. Their thought process was that when they get into an UNRWA vehicle, then they are protected. Yes, they are safe because it's an agency vehicle. Many see this as more evidence that UNRWA has been exploited and infiltrated by the terror group at its highest levels. Coming up, analysis on the role the Jewish vote will play in the upcoming U.S. election. With the U.S. elections coming up in days, all eyes are on the swing states, which could determine the outcome. We caught up with our friend Eli Pieps from the IDSF for his thoughts on which way the Jewish vote will go in some of these swing states. Eli Pieps, thanks for joining us. You're the international director of the IDSF, Israel Defense Security Forum. Uh, we want to talk about the Jewish vote. It's very critical uh, in the U.S. election coming up in just a few days. Tell us, first of all, what is the Jewish vote? Thank you so much, Chris. Pleasure being here. Um, yeah, the Jewish vote is, you know, it's obviously it's the vote of hundreds of thousands of Jews all across America, obviously very heavily concentrated in New York, in New Jersey, but also in the very important swing state of Pennsylvania. People always talk about swing voters. Who are the swing voters? And you'll see on, on uh, media will often will put up a group of swing voters. We're all going to. It's really hard to imagine how many people at this time are really sitting there and saying, hmm, I don't think I know enough about Trump, or I don't know enough about Harris, my vote could go either way. The one group of people who actually potentially feel that way 
are Jews, and particularly Jews coming from more of a center-left background. Those Jews who naturally would never vote for Trump and would naturally vote for Democrats um, have unfortunately um, had to um, exist over this past year where they saw a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism that was tolerated and to some extent even um, advanced by certain members of the Democratic Party. Mm. So yeah. they're very conflicted right now? Absolutely, very conflicted. And that is a group of people who, on the one hand, may go ahead and vote for Harris, but many of them are probably going to be pulling the trigger for Trump. And why would they go for Trump? Going for Trump because they see the way that the Democrats have ignored um, the the anti-Semitism that is growing within their midst. They understand now that it's not coincidental. It comes from their rhetoric. It comes from enabling um, an anti-Israel mentality. It comes from enabling a BDS, a, a kind of a delegitimization of Israel that has been allowed to metastasize within the Democratic Party for so long, and that now in 2024, when there is a war, you see the amount of vitriolic anti-Israelism mm. um, and the lack of trust and the belief, frankly, not just in against Israel, but the belief in our enemies, in terrorists. Um, that is something they just can't look away from. Um, and it's forcing many people almost against their will to vote for Trump. Mm. You've been a political consultant, political analyst. You mentioned Pennsylvania. Why is Pennsylvania so, obviously it's one of the key uh, battleground states, but what role does the Jewish vote have in Pennsylvania? Well, there are t significant Jewish populations in both Philadelphia uh, and both uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh, obviously, a few years ago, there was a terrible shooting at a synagogue there. So there is really a net real association with anti-Semitism and Pennsylvania. Um, obviously, University of Pennsylvania was one of those colleges that were subpoenaed um, and really acted um, horribly in front mm -hmm. of the entire um, U.S. public uh, by um, Elise Stefanik and her committee um, that showed that the University of Pennsylvania and other schools were allowing uh, a, a huge amount of anti-Semitism to take place on their, on their uh, campuses, um, endangering many uh, American Jewish students, um, and create a really a hostile environment. Um, so Pennsylvania for those reasons are significant to the Jewish population. Mm -hmm. And from the nation, when it comes to the election, there are only a number of, a handful of states um, that really are, could go either Republican or Democrat. Um, last election, I don't remember the numbers, but in 2020, it was about 20, 25,000 were the votes between Republican, between Trump and Biden. Um, and that seemed to be the, mm -hmm. the, the, the state that made the difference. Easily could be the case again. If you remember um, back when Harris was trying to figure out who was going to be her potential vice presidential candidate. One of the names, and probably the name that came in second place, was Governor Josh Shapiro. That's right, exactly. Jewish governor mm -hmm. of of Pennsylvania, someone who was seen until his, she, he was uh, promoting himself as a VP candidate, as someone who was strongly supportive of Israel. But in order to get the support of his party, he backed away from much of his support of Israel. And that, again, was seen as so obvious that he was pandering, mm -hmm. um, that for many American Jews, Democrats, very uncomfortable for them, very um, off-putting for them, and it led them, to, it really hardened that position that right now the Democratic Party is somewhat hostile to Jews and the pro-Israel mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that will you'll see Pennsylvania, many of all the states in the country, the amount of American Jews who will probably vote for Trump, will switch from voting for Biden to Trump, will probably be the most in Pennsylvania, a state that has really seen a lot of anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. um, and a state that also understands that they are really at the fulcrum of the election. Yeah. Uh, last question, Ellie. What about the, the vote here, the Jewish vote, the Americans here living in Israel, they're dual citizens, and they're voting. How do you see that vote going? Yeah, well, there are probably about 400,000 Americans who are here in Israel. Um, probably within the state of Pennsylvania, almost 25,000 there, so a significant amount uh, there. It, there is a tremendous desire to vote, um, to weigh in. You see over the last year the uh, impact that American foreign policy has on the lives of American citizens living in Israel. Um, and I, so I think we'll see a tremendous outpouring of support um, of A, to vote, but also be voting um, against the administration um, and in favor of a new approach, an approach that hopefully will empower Israel and the U.S. to be aligned and understanding that we're fighting against a similar enemy of the Iranian, uh, the Iranian regime. Yeah. Well, great uh, analysis, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, this coming Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Up next, a new film takes a deep dive into the history of anti-Semitism. Our next two segments are about an ancient hatred that's been around since recorded history. It has no boundaries, crosses religions and cultures, and is growing in our time. A new film just came out exploring this hatred. Here's the trailer. Take a look. I grew up in Lebanon and I hated the Jews. I was told that the Jews are evil, that they hate everybody, and they would do anything to achieve their goals. Disemboweled humans and raped women paraded around the streets while thousands cheer. Nothing has prepared any of us for this. But never imagined seeing what we witnessed after October 7th. This was the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. We must normalize massacres as the status quo. There are people openly celebrating mass murder. History is made that day. Very proud of my people. Very, very proud. They are not cheering for the liberation of the Palestinian people in Gaza. They are screaming, gas the Jews. I would love it if they would do it again and again and again. I don't understand anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is not just a normal bigotry. Where does this come from? Why are the Jews always hated? What's unique about anti-Semitism is that it is incredibly universal. It has longevity like no other hatred. And the intensity. I found myself on a quest to try and understand anti-Semitism. The Jews are blamed for all ills of the world. Why? Anti-Semitism requires a different type of explanation. When you see it so stark, you ask the question, so what is it? On October 7th, the world was forced to make a choice. When a society starts to indulge in this lurid, paranoid fantasy, every other hatred comes next. You think it's an accident that Iran, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, they hate Israel? Every person has to choose a side. Hitler somehow figured it out. The rabbis of the Talmud and Adolf Hitler actually agree on the root cause of anti-Semitism. So Hitler didn't want to kill the Jews because they were bad. He wanted to kill them because they were good. Our Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl interviewed the man who produced this amazing film, Tragic Awakening, Rabbi Raphael Shore. Rabbi Raphael Shore, welcome to Jerusalem Dateline. Thank you for having me on your show, Julie. Now you have made a film, Tragic Awakening, about an ancient hatred that has suddenly resurged. Uh, tell me, why did you make the film? That's a great question. I made the film because it didn't suddenly resurge. It's always been there. Mm -hmm. But we sometimes go into an illusion that it's disappeared. Mm -hmm. It morphs. It comes in different shapes and sizes. And in this generation, it's coming in the form of anti-Zionism and anti-Israel. So I felt that if we can explain the deeper reasons for anti-Semitism, we can help people understand how to get on the right side of history. That's very good. That's very good. Now you based that on a new book, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Jew, which actually you were writing before October 7th, three years ago. So, so why did you start writing it then? I've actually been sitting on this material, Julie, since I was at university 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I felt that a lot of the messages to the, that underlie anti-Semitism 
we're not ready to be heard by people. The subtitle is Learning to Love the Lessons of Jew Hatred. And the deeper reasons for anti-Semitism is that the Jewish people are bringing a message into the world that provides resistance, that the world doesn't always want to understand what it is that we're about. And where I get the le this knowledge from is from one of the greatest anti-Semites of all time, Adolf Hitler. So wow. it's fascinating. I expose his ideology and he was very clear that the Jewish people are bringing light into the world and he wanted darkness. And this has been a theme of anti-Semitism from the beginning. If we understand it, we can be much stronger knowing who we are. So why is it that people love darkness rather than light? Well, it's the human condition. We're made out of souls and bodies grafted together miraculously by God. And so there is that inner conflict in every human being. Are we going to conquer our desires and become a spiritual being? Or are we going to be led by them? That's not only in the individual life, that's in the life of nations and human psychology and the human history. Mm -hmm. And Adolf Hitler looked at human history and he said, sadly, the Jewish vision, the Judeo-Christian vision of bringing humanitarianism into the world has been victorious and he wanted to bring that he wanted to remove that and bring us back to the dark ages where it would be might makes right people don't understand this so i felt this is very important to communicate in a book and in a film so okay so we have october 7th and for maybe a week or two uh, the world was very sympathetic to israel and then suddenly israel became the bad guy again how can that happen it can happen because underlying this conflict is anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. The fact that the world is so concerned about what's happening here and so concerned about deaths of the civilian population, why aren't they as concerned about the Somalian civilian population or the Ukrainian? Th throughout this conflict, the media is absorbed and the, and the Professors are absorbed with this conflict more than any other because the Jews are involved. Mm -hmm. And that prevents, presents a double standard. Why didn't the world let the Palestinians out so they could be freed and refugees like in every other conflict? They kept them in, forcing Israel to deal with the situation, and then they could blame Israel. There's so many different cases like this where the world has lined up so they can come and delegitimize Israel. It's another form of Jew hatred. So how, do, how, how can it be combated? How can we combat that? It is a tremendous challenge to combat it because the forces of evil are putting hundreds of millions of dollars a year through Al Jazeera and the media, and then they've got the professors and the elites. It's very difficult. What I'm trying to do here is provide enough clarity to, so that people who are on the right side of history, people who are Jewish, people who are not Jewish, who want to stand with Israel, can have enough clarity that not only they understand the underlying anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. so they don't get fooled and feel bad about supporting Israel or being Jewish, but they can actually be proud. Because in the end of the day, this is a fight against America, it's a fight against Judeo-Christian values, it's a fight against Christianity, and it's a fight against the Jews. And we need to stand together, and that's what I'm trying to do, give strength so that we can have moral self-confidence to stand up for what is right. Well, that sounds like an amazing film on such an important topic. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media, and you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can receive information on breaking news. And please keep praying for Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem, for the idea of soldiers and all those caught in harm's way, and for the hostages in Gaza to come home. I'm Chris Mitchell. For all of us here at the Jerusalem Bureau, we'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.